Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started this afternoon session. Uh, the final exam is tomorrow. That normally keeps people quiet. The final exam is tomorrow. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started with our afternoon session. We have a great panel, so I am not going to get in the way. The title of our uh, session is Does Society Invest Wisely in College? So issues of financial aid, public funding for college. Uh, our speakers are Sandy Baum from the Urban Institute, Laura Perna from the University of Pennsylvania, and Judy Scott Clayton from Teachers College CCRC CAPSI. Um, I'm, let's just get started. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you. So we've been talking some about the payoff to students and to society from more higher education, but a big question is whether society invests appropriately uh, in trying to achieve these goals. And I think everyone knows that over time we've been running into some problems with that. And I think that it's particularly important to ask this question. Laura's gonna be talking some about the efforts to have free college. And I feel like we're talking a lot about the price without focusing enough on what resources we're willing to put into higher education to make sure that we can really support students to be successful. So I'm just going to go over some uh, of the background about how we actually are funding higher education. There are strong equity and efficiency arguments for public investments in higher education. Equity because it's, we know that there's a high personal payoff to higher education, and it's not fair by most people's definitions of fair that your access to those opportunities should be so tied to your financial circumstances. But there are also, of course, efficiency arguments because as a society, we're simply wasting our resources if we don't provide what people need in terms of being able to uh, take advantage of opportunities. And the reality is that so federal and state and local governments are all engaged in this process, but the funding, particularly at the state level, has not kept up with rising enrollments. And there are a number of questions about how should the funding be structured, how should it be targeted in the ways that will, it will do the most. Should we be fo focusing on funds for institutions? Should we be focusing on funds that go directly to students in the form of student aid? And particularly when you're talking about funding institutions, how are those funds uh, allocated across different types of institutions given that those institutions both produce very different things, offer very different services, and educate very different types of students. In particular, I think one of the discussions that anybody involved in a community college is aware of is the difference in the public subsidies for four-year and two-year public colleges. This is a graph from the College Board's Trends in College Pricing Report that looks at the average subsidies to per student subsidies in public four-year on the left and public two-year on the right colleges across the nation. And, and on top of that, they are, they're, so the subsidy is orange and the net tuition revenue is blue. And so what you see is that the subsidies per student are much higher in public four-year colleges. And because the tuition revenues are also higher, there are just much higher resource levels to work with at public four-year colleges than at public two-year colleges. How we decide how much these different institutions need and how we're gonna allocate that, this needs to be closer to the top of the agenda for state governments. If you look at the breakdown of revenues for two, public two-year and public four-year colleges, you can see that state and local appropriations have been a declining percentage of total revenues in both of those sectors. And for community colleges, it's particularly important to note that actually local revenues have been stronger, ha have not declined in the same way that state revenues have. So when you look at those total subsidies, the decline in state, rev in, in state appropriations is actually somewhat masked by the role of local appropriations. These changes in appropriations are very significant in terms of tuition prices. And of course, those tuition prices have a major impact on students. This is not a graph about causation, but it is quite notable to look at the correlation between state and local funding per student 
and tuition prices in the public sector. So the blue line here is funding per full-time equivalent student. The orange line is tuition and fees. And what you see is that in years when funding per student declines or grows very slowly, you have much bigger tuition increases than when uh, the state appropriations are healthier. And I've been making this graph for the trends report for many years, and it's just been fascinating to watch that, you know, it keeps, we keep adding those cycles where they move in opposite directions. So it's pretty clear that this makes a very, very big difference. And those appropriations per student, though, it's a little bit complicated. It's not just about the state not putting money into higher education. It is the interaction of what is happening to enrollments and what is happening to appropriations. So a significant portion of the change of the decline in appropriations per student is attributable to increasing enrollments. So this graph starts, this is from the um, Urban Institute College Affordability college affordability website that Catherine Rampell was gracious enough to reference this morning. And it starts in 1999-2000 at zero. And then it shows what the change has been in the blue line in public sector FTE enrollment, in the red line in higher education appropriations, and um, in, therefore in the green line in state and local public higher education appropriations per student. And so what you see is that it's true, for example, during the recession that appropriations really did decline, but at the same time, enrollments were rising. And when you have that combination of forces, that's when you get the really serious declines. And if we didn't have these enrollment increases, then we would not have nearly the same problem in terms of declining revenues per student. Um, what I mentioned about state and local support, I think we don't see this very often, but here the blue line is state support and the red line is local support, again starting at zero. So um, what you see is that local support, although not growing steadily, has certainly increased much more dramatically. Local support is smaller, so percentages are, are not dollars, but still in terms of maintaining that support, local governments have, governments have done better. Now, one of the things that we always talk, we always talk about averages, and the reality is that averages hide lots of differences. Some of these differences are differences across states, but many of them are also differences within states in terms of how individual institutions are funded. And I think, you know, those averages that I showed you about the average uh, state appropriations per student being so much higher in the public four-year than the public two-year sector. This graph, I think, is really interesting because it divides the institutions or the students at institutions into deciles within sector. So at public research universities, public masters, and public associate uh, institutions across the nation, actually, the median student in each of those uh, sectors is getting about the same subsidy per student, but when you look at public research universities, you see that there are a few public research universities that get much larger subsidies per student. This is a very different story, I think, than just looking at the averages. And we just really need to have more information about this because these are public research universities that are doing a lot of things other than educating undergraduate students. It doesn't mean that their undergraduate students are getting those huge subsidies. So I don't have a detailed explanation about what's going on here, but I just put this together and thought, oh my goodness, that is really a different story that we do have to investigate instead of just complaining about average subsidies per, um, per student in the different sectors. Part of the variation is definitely variation by state, and I think that's really critical because we, we tend to have a national conversation. I'm sure you all have you know, conversations within your states, but putting those into context is really important. So this graph shows you state and local funding for higher education per student and per $1,000 in personal income by state. The, the bars are uh, per student. And you can see that if you live in New Hampshire, uh, you, they don't put very much money into public higher education. Uh, but if you're in Wyoming or Alaska, there is much more funding per student. And it's not, part of this is about some states have more money and therefore they can afford to put more money into uh, higher education. But those little diamonds are funding per thousand dollars in personal income. And so you can see that they are also sort of all over the map. And what it means is that the effort that some states are making is much stronger than the effort that other states are making. 
So that's about appropriations, and we know that by and large what states are doing is funding institutions, but there are also state grant programs where the money is going to individual students. And in fact, as a percentage of total state support for higher education, grant aid has been increasing over time. So it was 7% of the total in 1993-94, 10% a decade later, and 13% a decade later than that. And that may be good news because it's possible to target financial aid at the students who need it most, and it may not be such good news because an uh, not an increasing portion now, but certainly over this period of time, an increasing portion of that state grant aid has been allocated not on the basis of financial circumstances, but on the basis of high school <laughs> academic achievement. The state grant programs are also all over the map, just as the appropriations per student are. And this graph shows you, it's based on, um, it's a graph from Trends in Student Aid, also the College Board, but it is based on data uh, from, from NASCAP uh, on state, uh, state grant aid. And it shows you that in 2014-15, in the nation as a whole, state grant aid amounted to $750 per undergraduate student. But in South Carolina, it was about $2,000. And then New Hampshire, again, gets uh, the award for being at the bottom of the pile because they don't have a state grant program anymore. Uh, um, very notable is that the two highest states there, Georgia and South Carolina, are not need-based states. So the states, a number of the states with the most generous grant programs are states that are giving out a lot of grant aid, but they're not giving it uh, to the students who need it most, or they are at least giving a significant portion of it to students who do not need it most. And so that, again, is something else that varies tremendously by state. Lots of states do base all of their state grants on need, on financial circumstances, and this shows you the distribution of states by the percentage of their state grants that are based, are allocated, uh, based at least partially on the financial cir um, circumstances of the recipients. So you see Georgia uh, at the bottom there. Um, but I think people maybe don't realize how many states really are focusing entirely on need-based aid. And that means that they can use their funds if they don't have I mean, it, it, when you think about how expensive it is to give a, an extra $1,000 per student to the institution so that every student in a public college can get that money, a state grant program, one, can uh, distribute the funds not only to students enrolled in public institutions, but also in private institutions, but it can say we're going to use the money to uh, fund the students who need it most. So um, that is a really, really significant um, factor. But it's also true that there are state grant programs and then there are institutional grant programs at public institutions. In a sense, it's the same money, right? Like these, you know, when people complain about using tuition dollars for, um, for grants and they say, now, you know, I'm paying, my tuition is paying for you to go to college, that's not fair, it's a, it's a tuition subsidy. It's not really that because it's still money that comes from the state and it's just being allocated through the institution. And you can see that in fact, institutional grant aid, even at public institutions, is a very, very significant portion of the grant aid that students receive. So grant aid, is really important to students, and state grant aid is a small piece of that. Federal grant aid is much more important, and during the Great Recession, the federal government actually doubled its expenditures on Pell Grants for low-income students. So federal aid, and particularly if you add the federal tax credits, the American Opportunity Tax Credit in, federal aid is an increasing uh, percentage of the funding that goes to students because uh, federal grant aid is, federal student aid is the green line here, and you see that big run up in 2009 and 2010. Well, that's not what was happening as we saw before to state appropriations. So again, the federal role is taking more and more of the responsibility for financing college education. That's really significant because the federal government has uh, similar goals but different priorities from many state governments um, and of course it raises questions about whether the federal government is going to just actually keep handing students money or whether it's going to be increasingly involved um, in accountability. I guess we don't really know what's going to be happening in the next few years as I think Tom mentioned that also. Um, but uh, the, the role of financial aid is 
is particularly important. I think we should not be focused only on the appropriations that are going to institutions because targeted grant aid can make a very, very big difference. Targeted grant aid, can you can tell students that the grant aid is going to be available for them. And if we had better early commitment of financial aid, then we might be able to help students, young students, prepare more so they will be more ready for college than they are when they grow up thinking that they won't be able to afford it. To the extent that we are using grant aid and giving it to at-risk students, there should be a way, and Judy and I have written about this, of incorporating with that uh, funding better guidance for students so that they make better choices about where and what to study. And that has to happen before they get to school because once they are enrolled, like you know, you enroll at say a for-profit institution that is very interested in keeping you there, they're not likely to recommend that you switch to a community college. So it really has to happen through the financial aid system, not just on the campus level. Financial aid can also affect enrollment intensity depending on how it's structured. And if we did a better job of structuring it, we should be able to do a better uh, job of having it have a larger impact on persistence and completion and time to degree. It's tough to do that with just general uh, appropriations, but financial aid, although it, it needs to be reasonably simple, can have an impact on completion. And I just you know, wanna emphasize how important this is. We're really talking about access here and about funding, but we need to be talking about completion. And the completion rates are shocking, particularly for part-time students. This shows you, um, Completion rates for full-time students are actually much higher than the rates we usually cite because completion rates are so low for part-time students. So we need to think not just about the dollars of funding, but how those dollars are allocated. Thank you. Great, hello everyone. It's nice to be here today. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with you. So um, my presentation really builds on Sandy's in some really nice ways, I think. So it's clear from the, all the data that she presented that we make lots of choices with how we allocate resources, right? So the federal government makes choices, state governments, institutions. We make decisions about how to allocate money to different sectors of higher education. We make decisions about allocating financial aid based on merit or financial need. My presentation is really focusing on an emerging approach and really that involves a whole lot of decisions also. Um, we could retitle the, the main question and focus on my presentation is to have us think about our college promise programs a wise societal investment. And really to understand the answer to that question, we have to first think about, well, what are college promise programs? What do we want them to do? And are they structured to achieve those things that we think are important? So we're all here today because we agree that higher education matters. It matters to individuals. It matters to our society. We also know that there's tremendous variation across groups in higher education outcomes, which means unequal opportunity to realize those many benefits. College Promise programs are an emerging strategy that is being developed across the country. This map is a little bit out of date. Go to our website if you'd like to see uh, one of a, a more current map. Um, but programs are being developed by colleges and universities, by foundations, private corporations, and state and local governments. And there are different entities out there right now that you should be aware of that are also collecting information. So Mary Rahner from WestEd is collecting information, especially about programs in California. Just as a point of reference, as of August 2016, there were 33 programs in California alone that had that promise word in them. And 13 of those 33 were established only in, in the first eight months of 2016. Education Commission of the States and Emily Parker is here. She's collecting data on state level promise programs. So there's, there are things happening at multiple levels of government and there are multiple people that are paying attention to these programs. Our work has really been focused, you know, we've been looking at this now for uh, more than a year and still stuck on this first question, what is a promise program? So our working conceptual definition is really to think about, well, what is, how, how might we conceptualize this involves, these are programs that are designed to incentivize college attainment, 
by rewarding students who satisfy specified criteria. And so there are multiple decisions that we have within that definition. What is being promised, or what's the reward that's going to have a student won't get? What's required to get that promised reward, and then who's eligible to get the reward? There are some programs, some promise programs, and it, so I'm, I'm referring when I say promise programs, there are many programs out there that you're using the word promise that we're including attention to, and other programs that look like those programs that aren't called promise programs. That, so that's adding to some of the confusion, I think. But you could think there are some programs that guarantee transfer of credit, they guarantee college admission. We're really focusing on those programs that have some sort of financial promise to them. So the basic theory of change that we're uh, adopting for our examination is a, essentially a human capital framework where students first are thinking about, um, so assuming students decide to go and persist in college based on a, an assessment of the benefits and the costs by providing extra financial resources that hopefully incentivizes college enrollment, going to college, as we've been talking about all day, results in many uh, benefits in the labor market, including higher earnings. One question that we're trying to think about is, well, what makes a, a promise program different than any other financial aid program, right? Because this is the basic model of any financial aid program. I am an optimistic person, so I'm thinking that promise programs may have the potential to be something more than that, right? Because we know that money matters, but it's not all that matters to college going and college completion. So one of the perspectives that we have for college promise programs is that they have a place-based component to them. So uh, traditional, one of the uh, well-known place-based uh, scholarship programs is the Kalamazoo Promise Program. So that's in a particular school district serving a very particular type of community. There are also programs that recognize place that require residency in other units besides, uh, so require residency in particular units like a state, a county, a city, a school, some programs require attendance at particular schools or school districts. So a place-based program ostensibly recognizes that college-going resources and opportunities really vary based on where you live. So a lot of the research pays attention to demographic characteristics um, as you know, being one way in which college outcomes vary, but this is really a lens that emphasizes place. We know that college outcomes vary based on data, so um, these data come, Pat Patrick Kelly actually uh, was helpful in getting these data. Uh, the five states that are highlighted here are ones that Joni Finney, a colleague of mine at Penn GSC, looked at. Um, but you can see the variation across states in the share of the population that has attained at least an associate's degree. We also know that there's great variation even within states. So here's a map that shows the percentage of adults who have at least an associate's degree by county. And so there's quite a lot of variation that's going on. And so place-based programs have the potential to take that into consideration. <coughs> so our project has really been uh, trying to draw on resources that these other entities, the Upjohn Institute, um, Civic Nation, um, and other organizations have been um, devoting to try to understand what these programs are. We're do doing a wide search to really um, try to understand the landscape of these programs, identify their characteristics, try to think about what are the important characteristics to pay attention to. And then our goal has been to produce a database first, you know, to try to understand what the population of programs is, then to identify meaningful categories within those programs, and then get to you know, the, the, our other goals around trying to provide research-based recommendations for how these programs actually should be structured. I have a great team. I just want to give a shout out to them. Elaine Lee, in particular, is a doctoral student at Penn who's been really, really helpful. We've received support um, from Martha Cantor with Civic Nation. She's been an important driver for this work and is fairly interested in trying to understand what are the research-based practices that we should be recommending with these programs. So we have a searchable database up on our website now. This is um, a resource that we've put out there um, to try to help the community come together. One of the challenges from a research perspective is that there is just so much variation in how information about these programs is being presented. And so it's really hard to know what programs are actually similar to or different from each other. 
So uh, we have some fields that you can search on that indicates uh, variation in awards, funding sources, things like that. It's been very interesting as some people have emailed us and said, our program's in your database, but we don't think it's a promise program. And other people have emailed and said, we're not in your database, but we want to be in there. So uh, we're trying to think about those decision-making roles. Welcome any input, input or feedback. Just to give you a sense, don't pay too much attention to the percentages because, again, we don't really know the population, right? It's evolving. But this gives you a sense of how much variation just in the unit of analysis we have. So as I said, we're trying to move towards some meaningful categories of types of programs and paying attention to those three questions I raised at the beginning. So what is being promised? So one area of variation is the extent to which um, the nature of the financial award varies. So there are programs that award first dollar versus last dollar. There is a lot of variation in, in the magnitude of the award. So some are focusing on last dollar up to tuition and fees. Some are um, some other type of cost. There's variation in what's required to receive the award. So one type of variation is how long you have to actually be in a place in order to get an award. And you can see how that would matter, right, in terms of the extent to which the place can actually come together to help a student be ready for college. And then there's variation in who's eligible, so the extent to which it's generally available to anyone who lives in a particular place, or do we have criteria based on financial need or other characteristics. So it seems clear that we need a different approach. We've been talking a lot about um, how we need to improve completion at a variety of different, in terms of certificates and, and di different degree levels. Um, you know, whether we, this is actually going to be an approach that makes meaningful progress in terms of closing gaps in, in uh, college enrollment is going to depend on how the programs are actually structured. There's an emerging body of research some, uh, by some people in the room. Judy Scott Clayton has done some work on college-related college promise programs. But more research is needed in, to, under, to understand the ideal designs of the programs and the ways in which different programs are serving different sectors of higher education in different communities in different regions and states. And there's been some mention today, too, of um, attention to the non-traditional student. So many of these programs are focused on and assuming that traditional movement from high school right into college. And we're, we're really um, missing an important sector of the population. So these are this, just some of the questions that we're trying to put out there and encourage people to focus on. One of our big concerns is really uh, from a, our, you know, our perspective is that it's really important to think about the extent to which these programs are going to provide benefits to people who wouldn't already um, receive some sort of assistance to go to college or who would go to college even without the program. So lots of different graphs that we could show that would show the magnitude of differences in college opportunity based on demographic characteristics. Here's just one. So um, just 15 percent of students from the lowest socioeconomic status quartile uh, so these are folks who are 10th graders in 2002. Just 15% from the lowest quartile achieve a bachelor's degree within eight years of their scheduled high school graduation, compared with 60% of students from the highest quartile. We have big inequity in our system. The other, a second type of question is the extent to which these programs are structured to recognize that money matters, but other things matter too. We know academic readiness matters. We know that. Um, information about college and about financial aid matters. Also paying attention to the characteristics, and this was mentioned earlier, Tom mentioned this in his talk, the extent to which we have, the res there are um, the resources available in the institutions that students are attending to help ensure that students can not only get there, but also move their way through um, whatever program they're in and perhaps into another program as well. Another important question about these programs has to do with their sustainability. Um, they're financed in a whole lot of ways, and this is another area, I think, that requires additional attention. The College Promise Campaign and, and ETS have spent some time trying to advance knowledge of potential financial models, um, but especially as we think about the trends around declines in state funding for higher education, we're seeing some 
with these programs, perhaps some emergence of other sources of funding for programs. And so thinking about um, how that works, what's sustainable, perhaps some unintended consequences of things, of those approaches is important. And then um, finally, so we have lots and lots of questions about these programs um, in terms of intended and unintended consequences for all kinds of different stakeholders. We're sponsoring a conference. We had a call for proposal that went out earlier this year. But if you're interested in learning more about College Promise programs, um, go to our website and you can register and we'll keep you posted for that. So that's it for me. Thank you. OK, great. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, my name is Judy Scott Clayton. I am uh, one of the CAPSI uh, research team members. And uh, before I go into this talk, I just want to note that uh, CAPSI has done a bunch of studies relating to financial aid, uh, several of which will be highlighted in the next breakout session. Um, so we have papers looking at um, uh, the effect of Pell Grants, the effect of student loan access, the effect of federal work study, the effect of uh, satisfactory academic progress policies. Um, so definitely, I hope you guys will, will take advantage of those breakouts and uh, even afterwards dig in and see um, some of the stuff that we've done. There's too much to, to cram all into one presentation. But what I'm going to try to do here is kind of take a step back from any one particular research study and think about uh, really big picture what I think are some of the central challenges facing uh, the US model of financial aid. Uh, before we talk about the challenges, it's also important to recognize some of the core strengths of the U.S. model of financial aid, which is um, arguably the, the largest, the most diverse, um, and the most flexible system of higher education uh, globally with over 4,500 individual uh, post-secondary institutions. Uh, covering the full range of public, private, nonprofit options, online options, brick and mortar options, hybrid options, um, a range of different levels of credentials um, across a very wide range of programs of study, vocational programs, um, applied associate's degrees to more traditional bachelor's degrees. Um, and uh, among the highest rates of college entry in the world, um, completion is, is a, a little bit more mediocre, as many of you are aware, but at least as far as getting students uh, toe into higher education, uh, the U.S. Uh, still remains among um, the world's leaders in that statistic. And it's important to recognize that the U.S. model of financial aid, which is essentially a model in which we have you know, high prices, but also a lot of aid out there to help uh, support students um, to cover those prices, um, that high price, high aid model uh, is, is one alternative. A lot of other countries pursue a very low or even zero tuition model. And it's important to, to recognize that one of the advantages of a high aid uh, uh, model in which tuition can, can um, certainly at least be uh, above nothing is that it brings in significant private resources from those families and students that are able to pay, and then enables any given level of public investment to go further by targeting it um, more precisely to the students who really need it in order to be able to attend. So I have um, a quotation, it's probably a little too small for you to read, but this is from a British economist, Nick Barr, who in the late 90s um, made a progressive argument for the introduction of tuition fees for the first time in the UK system, uh, making the argument that it would allow the U uh, UK system to expand and access. Um, and so it, he wrote, countries typically pursue three efficiency goals in higher education, larger quantity, higher quality, and constant or falling public spending. Systems that rely only on public resources can generally achieve any two, but only at the expense of the third. So a system can be large and tax financed, but with worries about quality. And he gives the example, France, Germany, Greece, Italy. Or high quality and tax financed, but small, as in the UK until 1990. Or large and high quality, but very expensive, as in Scandinavia. 
Okay, so we're going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about challenges, but before we get there, it is important to acknowledge that um, having private resources be a part of higher education finance is a large part of what facilitates and enables the expansion of higher ed um, to both a wide variety of students and a wide variety of institutions and program types. So in the US now, um, nearly two thirds of students are receiving some type of grant aid. So financial aid is not a, a, a small piece, it's a huge piece for a huge swath of post-secondary entrance. And the single biggest grant program is the Pell Grant program, which is delivered as a, you know, a, a different people might react to this word differently, but basically as a voucher, um, which gives students the flexibility to use it uh, wherever they want to use it. It's not restricted to one uh, specific uh, sector. Okay, so that's kind of, those are some of the advantages that the US model brings to the table. But then of course, we know that there are problems. All is not rosy in this system. So if things are all so great, why do we have such persistent and even rising um, inequality by income in college enrollment and attainment rates? So this graph is showing the relationship between college entry and family income by quartile. And the dotted line is for cohorts that were coming of age um, around the early 80s, and the, the dark line are those um, coming of age around the turn of the century. And you can see that there's a very strong relationship between income and college access. And if anything, although rates are rising across the board, if anything, it looks like the inequality is getting worse. So that's a concern. And if you look at college completion rates among those who enter, we see a similar pattern with very high uh, income gaps in uh, the likelihood that, that somebody uh, who enters college will, will earn a bachelor's degree. And if anything, looks like it's maybe getting worse over time. Certainly doesn't look like it's getting dramatically better. We're well aware of concerns about rising student debt. This is uh, five-year default rates by institution sector uh, over time. So we can see those rates in the past few years have been rising uh, fairly sharply. And even if, if, if that graph doesn't freak you out, um, this one is looking at racial inequality in student loan debt. Um, so there, the, this graph is looking at the percent. And, you know, usually we think, okay, the bachelor's degree grads, we don't have to worry about them, they're all fine. Um, if you look at this um, by race, this is a percent of bachelor's degree graduates who owe more than they borrowed four years after earning a bachelor's degree. And that percentage is almost 50% for black bachelor's degree graduates. And uh, there, are, there are major racial gaps in default rates as well. Okay, so all of this contributes to uh, something we heard a little bit about this morning, a kind of waning public trust and support um, uh, regarding higher education. So this is from a public agenda uh, uh, poll um, where they're finding that the percentage of uh, adults who say a college degree is necessary is falling over time and now is down to 42% thinking that a college degree is necessary. And 34% um, say that colleges today mainly care about education and making sure students have a good educational experience, 34%. 59% say colleges today are more like businesses and care mainly about the bottom line. So that's kind of depressing. Um, so has the US model this kind of, okay, we've got private resources, we're gonna have high tuition, let there be high tuition, but then we're gonna try to solve that by giving students a lot of aid. Has it gone too far? Has it been kind of pushed to the breaking point? So the challenges of do, delivering uh, higher ed finance in this way with the, the high aid model are complexity and confusion about what's available. Uh, consumer information and protection. Do, do students have the, the information that they need to use that uh, to vote with their feet and, uh, in a way that's productive? Um, and how does this system serve or provide incentives not just for access but also for success? And kind of the question as we're going through this is, uh, do we need to throw out this model? Is it just so broken that we have to start over? Um, or what can we do to fix it while still preserving the advantages that, that um, it brings with it. 
Okay, so in turn, we'll talk about each of these. Okay, so starting with kind of the lower hanging fruit probably is um, the aid application process, which many of you know starts for most students by filling out a FAFSA form, which if you haven't seen it recently, I put it up here. So I hope everybody can read, read it. It's a little small. Um, now a lot, of, so the problem with this is that basically we have all this aid, but a lot of students don't know about it. It's kind of hidden under this web of bureaucracy and, and application procedures. The eligibility formula is um, 36 pages long. So you think this is bad, try being a financial aid administrator who has to actually take, you know, try to explain to students what happens with this information. Um, that is even longer than this thing. Um, and so students who most need the aid may not ever get to the point of um, realizing what they could get to attend. Um, progress has been made in terms of FAFSA filing rates over time, but we still know that there are people who enroll in college who probably would qualify for some aid that do not fill out a FAFSA. So this is filing rates by institution type in 2004, 2008, and 2012. And, um, I think one thing, you know, a lot of community college folks in the room here, one thing that continues to stand out is that community colleges actually have the lowest FAFSA filing rates of all these sectors, even though we know that many of the students um, are low income and likely would qualify for some type of financial support. It's also worth noting how much those rates have increased within community colleges over time. Some of that may be due to uh, efforts at the federal level. But I think a lot of that is just simply due to the awareness that the FAFSA is a barrier and it's been boots on the ground um, at community colleges um, and uh, aid advocacy organizations around the country um, and state policymakers mobilizing to help students get over that hurdle. Um, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. So if we think about the, the reforms that have been made with the FAFSA over the past few years, some questions have been taken off, the skip logic has been improved in the online process. Um, the, the, you know, we had the data retrieval tool at least for a little while. Hopefully that will come back, although you know, that certainly has been creating a lot of anxiety um, this cycle. Um, and the switch to using two years prior um, income information instead of last year. Those are all really helpful reforms, but if you think about the big picture, has it changed? You know, can a ninth grader or can somebody who's now working at a job and thinking, should I go back to school or not? Have they heard of the Pell Grant program? Do they know what they would likely get if they filled out a FAFSA? Have they heard of the FAFSA? It's not clear that these kind of incremental changes have changed the big picture of getting students information about what they would get well in advance of the time that they're actually making the decision. Okay, and um, the research that I and others have done has showed that you really don't need all the information on the FAFSA to figure out how much somebody would qualify for, so it's just not necessary. Um, and I do think this is one of the low-hanging fruits um, of, of reforming the U.S. system is uh, getting rid of the FAFSA and allowing students to um, j just base their eligibility off information they've already provided via the tax system. And there's uh, a bunch of proposals out there. There are differences, you know, little differences between them. But overall, I think um, this is an area where um, there's a fair amount of consensus that we could do better than we're doing now. Okay. Second kind of central challenge in a system where we're expecting, you know, we're providing this, uh, this, this voucher and expecting students to vote with their feet. Do they have the information that they need to make a good decision? And are they protected from kind of bad actors that might try to take advantage of them? So complexity and confusion and information is not just an issue with financial aid. Um, it's an issue for college choices more broadly. And um, a lot of the um, work that's been done around like the college scorecard and a lot of these state um, salary surfers and, and um, databases that are allowing students to look at graduation rates, employment rates, and earnings for different programs, different institutions. All of that is a step in the right direction, but it's not clear that just putting that information out there alone is going to be enough. So, um, and, and there's evidence that suggests that information alone might not be enough. Students really do benefit from having some more proactive, individualized guidance through the process. 
Um, and as Sandy noted, that, that uh, guidance really needs to be third party. Not, we can't rely on individual institutions to be providing um, kind of unbiased um, advice about where students should go or what they should do. There's also a question of if there are some institutions or some programs that we think nobody should go to, then maybe students shouldn't be uh, able to use their aid at those institutions. So there has to be some protection against uh, some regulations to protect students from kind of predatory um, programs. And then finally, even if students do um, get you know, the best information, make a good choice, college, like any other investment, is a risky investment. You may graduate into a recession. Something may happen that throws you off track and you don't finish. Um, there's always going to be some risk, even if you kind of are doing things right along the way, that when you get out, you may have some loans and you're not equipped to pay for them or, or not equipped to pay for them right away. Uh, maybe you need a little more time than you thought you would need. Um, so students need some protection against that. Um, and and uh, I think reforming the student loan repayment system, that's, this is also a doable um, challenge. This is a fixable challenge, and there are pr proposals on the table, uh, for example, from uh, Sudanarski on how the income-based repayment um, model could be reformed to help more students and be more protective against kind of bad income uh, realizations. Okay, the third major challenge of our system is that financial aid, it's a lot easier to use financial aid to promote access. Um, just to lower the price of college, it's a little more complicated to think about how can we use aid to promote not just access but completion. That requires kind of getting under the hood of financial aid program design, getting into the nitty gritty details and thinking about, okay, what are the embedded incentives here that are um, likely to you know, actually help students complete or not? Um, so most, most aid, it's much easier to orient aid around the idea of let's, you know, get students in the door rather than completion. And there's some argument, there's typically some argument about like should aid involve incentives or should it not involve incentives? And I would argue that you can't avoid incentives. It's not an argument about should we have them or should we not have them? They're there. It's just are we going to make them explicit and think about how to align them with our goals or are we just going to like not think about it and just kind of pretend like a dollar of aid is a dollar of aid and it doesn't matter what all the uh, fine print is. Um, so an example of implicit structural incentives would be uh, the limitation that you can, you can use Pell to cover 24 credits um, a year. We might not really think of that as an incentive, but that's an incentive to take longer to finish your program because if you take three years to finish a 60 credit program, you will get more Pell than if you try to do it in two years. If you take six years to finish a bachelor's degree, you will get more financial aid than you will if you want to finish it in four, or certainly than if you want to finish it in three. Um, so changing that to think about maybe uh, thinking about Pell funding credits or funding programs and then letting students decide um, what's the right pace for them um, is one example of how we could better align incentives with, with goals. Uh, we could also think about student performance incentives. And this is another one where there's a lot of argument, like should we have performance incentives or should we not? Guess what? Even Pell, as many of you know, even Pell, a need-based program, has implicit performance incentives in the form of satisfactory academic progress requirements. Um, what's unfortunate is that a lot of students don't really think of it that way and first learn of it when they're on the, on the brink of losing eligibility. So given that that incentive is embedded in the, in the rules of the program, can we think about you know, improving uh, what students know about it and improving support to actually make that work as an incentive for students to improve their um, achievement as opposed to just using it basically in a punitive way to cut students off when they're not doing well. And then there are also uh, incentives that can be placed on institutions. Originally, um, the college scorecard was kind of thought that maybe that will be the first step towards having some federal um, performance accountability model. Um, the states are moving full steam ahead on that. Um, and I think one of the challenges here is it seems kind of obvious or, you know, common sense that we should um, have uh, performance funding models that are oriented around completion rather than enrollment. 
And yet, we have to worry about unintended consequences, strategic behavior, and all these other ways that kind of we think we're doing one thing, but then when the policy gets out there, um, it doesn't work the way we thought. So this is, the, this is not the lowest hanging fruit, I would say, trying to figure out how to make financial aid work to promote completion rather than um, just access. Um, it's trickier than just um, getting rid of the FAFSA, probably. Um, but I think it's certainly an area of very active experimentation, an area where um, there's a lot that, that can be done to improve relative to um, the way things are now. Okay, and then finally, um, it's not just about you know, money and you know, what kind of incentives are here, but also what kind of support students have um, while they're enrolled. Okay, a final complication, and this links back to uh, Sandy's presentation, that just kind of overlays all of these challenges are the fact that there is not just one provider of financial aid. Uh, there are interactions between the federal and state level policy, as well as institution level policy. Um, so, and that's a strength, arguably, that's a strength of the U.S. system because um, there are kind of different pieces that one actor might do better than the other. The federal um, government is better equipped to buffer the, the consequences of economic shocks like the Great Recession. It also reflects that students are mobile. So if a state invests, you know, some of that investment is going to cross state lines. Um, on the other hand, state-level policies um, may better reflect the local labor market demands and state-specific demographics. But we have to think about these interactions when we're making policy at any one of these levels. So, um, for example, if, um, if free college programs take off in a lot of localities, does that give the federal government then more leeway to cut back on Pell because they know the states are going to come in and cover the last dollar. Okay, so you can't make policy at one level without taking the responses of the other levels into account. Okay, so to wrap up, does society invest wisely in education? Um, I think there's no question, certainly there's a consensus, I'm sure, in this room that investments in higher education have a very high payoff um, for society. And now is not the time to scale back. But that's not at all to reduce the urgency um, that we should bring to the task of reforming and addressing the challenges that are um, in place in the US model and trying to figure out how we can um, improve outcomes, reduce risk, reduce uh, economic inequality and in outcomes, reduce racial gaps. Um, and I think free college proposals may well be part of that solution. Um, probably not like throwing out the whole US model and starting from scratch and having a completely uh, free system of, of higher education. I don't think anybody is thinking in quite that drastic terms, but certainly in some segments of US higher education, there may be a very powerful role for these types of programs. If you think about just the communication value of the free college message, um, if you, uh, at some point, I was looking at, you know, Google hits. If you Googled free college in the months after um, Obama's uh, State of the Union speech, whatever year that was, it was like millions of hits for free college. If you compared the number of hits to, like, proposal to in increase Pell Grants by 10%, um, it's like, what is that even? I mean, it was orders of magnitude difference in the communication impact. People know what free college means. A lot of people literally have never heard of Pell, literally have never heard of the FAFSA. Um, so how can we harness that power um, to utilize the, the power of that message to kind of address some of the other challenges at the same time? Okay, and it's important to recognize that the challenges of the U.S. system do go beyond just price and that we, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So can we fix this model? It's crucial that we fix this model if we want um, if we want to maintain the sort of high access, um, the diversity and the flexibility that we've come to um, take for granted. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Sandy, Laura, Judy. We have plenty of time for questions. Jim. 
not sure. The, the, I, it's a question for, I guess, uh, I'd like to hear uh, a response from a couple of the panelists. You know, one of the tendencies that we're seeing more and more in enrollment is the amount of high school students who are coming to community colleges. And in some cases, 20 or 30 percent of the enrollment is, uh, you know, our high school students. Many of those programs are already paid for by states through, you know, various reimbursement programs. So a middle college will w wind up with, you know, kids graduating from high school and getting an associate's degree for free. And the, I, I wonder about what the impact of that will be, both on Pell, but also on the issue of, uh, you know, America's College Promise. You know, one of the, we have many problems in our educational system, right? Um, one of the problems that we have, though, is the lack of alignment between high school and college. And so perhaps programs like that, you know, dual enrollment, I think, has, has the potential, I think, for us to be thinking more as a system where we think more explicitly about the links between K through 12 and higher education to ensure that what students are learning in high school actually does prepare them for college level work. That has to happen more systematically and the extent, there are all sorts of questions we could ask about who's getting, who's actually doing that and um, the accessibility and, and things like that. But um, I think, you know, I, I, I think we have to think more about mechanisms that help students navigate their way from one institution successfully into another without the loss of credit. There are other people in the room who know a whole lot more about uh, these types of initiatives. So, I mean, the research on those programs where you actually can earn, a, not just dual enroll and take some credits, but actually earn an associate's degree while you're in high school are pretty impressive. Um, and I, it, like from an economic perspective, it kind of makes sense that as the demand for higher skills, as the demand for more educated workers increases, that not all of that increase should come from students spending more and more years of their life enrolled, but some of that is about packing more in to the same amount of time. So, but it is, I think it's a very interesting question, then what are the implications of that? If that's something that we want to, you know, promote or, or at least allow and enable, um, what implications does that have for Pell? And now not just the interactions between federal and state higher education policy and higher education funding, but federal and state K through 12 funding. Yeah, I mean, I would just say we should look at what this means about what people are doing in high school. I mean, because there is sort of a suggestion here that uh, maybe that's a waste of time and we need to redefine it. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question that maybe um, any of the three of you or, or all of you could address. It's, it would be primarily for Laura, but I know Sandy and, and Judy would both have something to say to it. And it's about the Promise Program concept, which I really do think is important, but also the, the details matter, as, as you were pointing out, and kind of specifying what's meant by it. Because you can see, I think, from our experience with performance funding, how people kind of glom onto a concept and implement something that's there are horrible versions of it and there are good versions of it and, and I think it's easy to convince yourself that you've implemented a promise program when you know it, it's it's something that probably wouldn't none of us would would, would want to see in place um, but there, there have been a couple of experiments around promise programs that have that have been pretty interesting because they agree in the mechanism for how they work the one in New Brunswick and the one in Nebraska um, those are the only controlled experiments I'm aware of but in, in both of them, the college enrollment rates didn't increase, and the graduation rates within categories of institutions didn't increase, right? So um, the graduation rates for community college students didn't, didn't increase, the graduation rates for four-year college students didn't increase, but they both found significant effects because more students went to better institutions. Mm -hmm. So the number of students attending four-year institutions who would have gone to two-year institution, institutions went up and the number of students who went to selective four-year institutions went up relative to who would have gone to open access institutions. So it looks like the mechanism is 
is choice, and, and that may not be a you know, popular conclusion in a room with a lot of community college uh, uh, folks in it, but it, it you know, I, th the, I think the other, the other conclusion you could draw from that is that, you know, maybe making community colleges work more like four-year institutions um, would be another, uh, like the, the ASAP program does at, at CUNY, but um, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are about the, the mechanism for how financial aid works and specifically promise programs. Yeah, great question. So uh, there are a couple of other, one other experiment that I know of is the degree project in Milwaukee, and there's emerging research from that as well. So uh, one part of the answer has to do with what's, what students are being allowed to, what the money, how they can use the money, right? And there are, there's a lot of variation in the types of institutions that students are permitted to attend with the financial aid that's award, awarded. So it would seem like if there are positive outcomes there in terms of enrollment at more selective institutions or at four-year institutions, the students must be allowed to use the money to attend those institutions, right? Um, there are many, one common um, model or one type that seems to be emerging from our typology work is a program that funds students to go to community college, specific, and it could be one specific community college or a set of community colleges, um, but that puts students on a different pathway than if they can attend any two-year or four-year institution. And so understanding the effects that these programs have really is going to depend on what we are incentivizing students to go, where we're incentivizing students to go, and then the extent to which there are supports for students at those institutions to ensure that they're successful. Um, so that's one part of the, the response. Um, and then I think it's related to that is just to think about the other criteria that are in place and how that might be playing out for other students. So um, in, with the degree project work, and this is Doug Harris, um, early results, that, um, that I saw from that project suggested that there's a, an academic achievement requirement. And so if you meet the academic achievement requirement, great, right? You, you have the incentive to do well. But if you don't meet that criteria, then it's like you have no hope, right? And so I think thinking about how those different mechanisms play out for different students is also Actually, the other consistent finding from the two experiments that I was aware of is that the effects were greater for stu students closer to the bottom of the eligibility, academic eligibility criteria. So the closer yeah, so. you were to the minimum requirements, the bigger the impact was, uh, the net impact was. Right, so. so understanding how those things happen, I think, is really important. And in some senses, because there are, are so many things going on, we do have an ability to learn potentially about what might work. I think it's really important that you're asking those questions. I mean, it's it's really, you know, the momentum for and the appeal of the word free, as, as Judy explained, um, is, you know, that's very compelling. But I think it, it's ending up focusing our attention just on that. And if we had unlimited resources, maybe this would be fine. But as we're seeing already, we have a shortage of funding. And when we think about how we would use any incremental funding, if that incremental funding is going only to people who don't need it, which is why they didn't get their tuition paid by the Pell program or a state need-based program, then that raises a lot of questions. And that, if it's a promise, the state appropriations and the state grant programs, need-based grant programs, are not promises. And if something's going to give, it's going to end up being the funding that is really helping the students that need it most and not the funding that is actually marginal funding to, you know, my kids going off to a community college because it's free. So asking the question of, is it really changing enrollment? And then what happens? I mean, we all know that a huge problem is the low completion rate, and it's money, but it's obviously, as we've said many times today already, much more than money. Hi, Kent Phillippe, the American Association of Community Colleges. When I listen to the conversation today, I haven't heard a lot, particularly thinking about the traditional models of funding higher education and, and aid, about the whole role of, of competencies and mm -hmm. accumulating from credits from prior learning assessment. You think about the high school dual enrollment sorts of things. It's, it's, less about seat time, more about, about um, competencies. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about 
from your perspectives, how that fits into this new environment. I know there's some experimental sites right now looking at that, but how, how, how can financial aid drive that conversation or should it drive that conversation for change? That's tricky. I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I definitely think like the, the simple version of that is a version of what I was saying earlier about having flexibility and not having such a rigid system that everybody has to follow, um, you know, taking 24 credits over a, cal over a calendar year. Um, at some point, you know, if, if students had more flexibility or if the funding model was more flexible, so that you know, if they're taking a really intensive, um, short program that is the equivalent of 30 credits, but it's it's covered in a four-month program or something like that, they could still get kind of an equivalent amount of aid. That's one thing. But then when you're talking about, I'm not sure if you're talking about, you know, should people be able to get financial aid for things that they already have demonstrated competency for? I think that's trickier. I haven't really thought about how that would work. I mean, that seems yeah. like an obvious yeah. question. If, you, if you're just taking a test, then it, you don't have the same costs and neither does the institution. The other thing is that, I mean, it's really clear that we need more flexibility and I think that's a really important thing. But as we're developing that, let's remember what has happened with the federal financial aid system and the for-profit sector and let's not recreate that in another way. Right, I think there's always this tension between wanting to promote and enable flexibility, but then always thinking at the same time of how could this be you know, perverted in a destructive way. Tom. I, I have two, two questions which I'll ask and then you can order. So, I mean, first of all, with these big differences in, in, the, in, state, the, in state financial aid policies with respect to need or not, I wonder, you know, what are we learning from that? I mean, are we, are we seeing differences in those states with respect to, uh, you know, who's going to college, with respect to the other types of gaps or inequalities that, you know, that we've identified, or maybe the, I mean, maybe the, oh, the federal, <coughs> federal finding, f financing or federal funds sort of overwhelm that. So that's one thing. And then this question for Laura really is that, you know, you raised a lot of questions that we have to ask and I know we don't have answers, but I'm wondering after, you know, looking at this and thinking about this for a couple of years, you know, what are one or two answers or that you, you know, you're willing to uh, kind of venture, understanding that, you know, there are other things that need to be nailed down, but, you know, what, what are, what, you know, what, what are you getting out of that, uh, you know, out of that thinking and what are, you know, are there some of these questions that we can eliminate and that we can say we've already gotten there? So anyway, you guys can figure out which, I'll, I'll, I'll talk okay. about the need, need, need versus merit aid um, at the state level for a minute. Just, um, I think uh, that there's evidence that both need-based and merit-based state aid programs can impact college enrollment um, and completion. Um, and I think one interest, really interesting pattern that emerges from the range of research that has been done is how much the state context is important. So the, the contrast between um, West Virginia's merit aid program, which is a pretty stringent, has pretty stringent merit requirements as they go. But West Virginia, if you, I think it was, I don't remember whose graph it was, one of your graphs, is 50th in um, college attainment. Um, they are, uh, it's a very, you know, um, socioeconomically um, disadvantaged state. And so for them to have a merit-based program, they're still bringing in a lot of um, low-income students into that merit aid program. And, you know, as the merit requirements go, even though they're stricter than some states, it's still, it's still like half of the incoming freshman class um, at the public uh, institutions. Compare that to Massachusetts, which also had a merit aid scholarship that turned out to actually decrease college attainment rates because, you um, Massachusetts already has really high college enrollment rates. So one of the things that that program did was uh, instead of you know, getting more people to enroll in college in the first place, it caused them to switch from institutions that you know, were better resourced 
into um, the public options, which um, don't spend as much per student, don't have as high completion rates. Um, and so I think that's just one example of how it's not just the design of the program, but the context in which the program is set that really matters for whether it may. So a need-based program probably makes you know, more sense in Massachusetts um, in terms of increasing access, whereas in some other states you can maybe get away with um, some of both. So um, I appreciate the question. Um, <laughs> Well, I guess a couple of things I'll stress, which I think we really have to be thinking about. So one is uh, we have having a sustainable approach is really important, right? Especially if you're gonna promise something to students early on in the pipeline, right? You look at some of the, what's being put out there about these programs and I don't know why anybody would have any confidence that there will be any money for them down the road, right? So we have, because we know from the research that that matters, right? People when they know er well, and at least we can uh, theorize, right? If you know earlier, then you can use the information to change your behavior and then have better outcomes, right? But if you don't have that assurance that the promise actually will be there, that's really important. And I think that's a question for some of these programs. I think a second is that uh, the place part really does matter, but we don't really know how to do that really well, right? So. Um, I think we're getting good at uh, being able to identify what the things are to do that help at the margin, right? So we know that students have to complete the FAFSA. We, we have a particular set of steps that have to be done, but um, simply having those steps outlined isn't really enough to change how people are thinking about college as whether it's a realistic type of option or understanding what how that plays out within a particular community with a particular economic context with particular schools that have particular types of academic resources. Um, you know, how we really create meaningful opportunity for students not only to go to succeed. And I think that has to be at the place based, somehow we have to take that into account in a meaningful type of way. Um, I continue, I'm in the question phase because I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> have me back. I'll, 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 I promise I'll have more answers. Go ahead. Um, to those of you who are a lot more knowledgeable about the current political environment, okay, than I am maybe. I'm, uh, you, you talked about some low-hanging fruit uh, out there, <coughs> like uh, simplifying FAF, the uh, Pell Award uh, process, and uh, my favorite one is the uh, income contingent repayment plan. Given the current political environment, what do you think is possible? I, I think myself that it looks like it, it's going to be fairly easy, maybe, to do the Pell on a postcard thing because Lamar Alexander's in there. He's not dumb. He know he studied the whole thing. That has a chance of succeeding, I think. What do you think? I would like to think so. I mean, yeah, I always hesitate to make any kinds of political predictions because that's not my forte. But I agree. Um, I guess, you know, there's some just looking back over history where stuff that seems like it's low-hanging fruit and still it remains, you know, unpicked. Um, so there's some kind of, you know, meta uh, anxiety about whether one's beliefs are you know, realistic. But yeah, I, I think that um, there's a lot of opposition to the Pell on the postcard idea. So I think that it's, we might get more simplification. I would have said we could use IRS data. That's yeah, like that's low hanging fruit, but now it's a little <laughs> bit, uh, it doesn't really make sense to say that in the current environment. Um, I, I think we could get more simplification, but I mean, there really is like at the state level and at the institutional level, you know, people are just terrifically nervous about simplification. And so I think the IRS and the simplification have to go together. I actually think we are, 
reasonably likely to get some progress on income-driven repayment, and that would be because we already have these programs, and what has happened is that they have become quite complicated and are likely to get expensive. So both the people who want to help students ease the repayment burdens and the people who are worried about the federal budget are going to be looking for, for changes there. Okay, well, seeing no more questions, we can uh, thank our panelists. And we have uh, breakout sessions starting at 3.30, which will explore the, these topics in more detail, further detail. Thank you very much. Thank you.